not go nice. any further until we hear the piano, Mike says. Nice fade to black. <laughs> Gotta have the piano portion. That's to have the piano by. 88 fingers, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's funny you say that because we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> oh, cool. Yes. yes okay. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for uh, April the 9th. Yay. Yay! Happy Easter! Happy Easter, everybody. Happy yes. Easter. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, my name Easter is Chris Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the two bunny salute. <laughs> <laughs> okay um my name is chris kerwin i'm the host of this evening i don't know why but i am <laughs> uh, and i'm the creator of the social media channels known as astronomy by the bay i'm an amateur astronomer just an amateur astronomer and a member of the royal astronomical society of canada <laughs> All right. First of all, I'd like to introduce our two regular co-hosts. I'd like to introduce them, but uh, two regular co-hosts for this evening. Uh, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton, New Brunswick. Paul, good evening. Hampton, yep, there it is Hamp again. Hampton. Is a silent H? <laughs> Hampton. Uh, Hampton. Higgs and Ham. Now, let's go Am and Higgs. If you're from Newfoundland, you say Am and Eggs. Eggs. Yeah. You do. You do. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> what are we talking about today? Is this astronomy or? I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, and our other regular co host here in the program, Mr. Mike Powell from the Ryobi Observatory here in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right over Observatory. Yeah. That's, that's perfect. You should change that, Mike, to the Ryobi Observatory. That's hard to Close say. in the dark. If I was to paint the inside of the observatory like that lime green, yeah. Yeah. That would be awesome. Alien green. You'd never know if you get I, sick, would you? I have a scope that color. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, this one's for beginners. Um, with the nice weather on the way, many of us are thinking about spending more time under the stars. Now, for those of us who have practiced this hobby for a while, like us, um, our most asked question is probably, what should I buy for equipment to get started? That's the one I get asked a lot, I know. Um, well, there's no real easy answer. There are several questions to ask yourself first, um, and there are lots of price ranges as well, of course, to, uh, to look at. Tonight, we're going to uh, we'll pretend that you have about 300 bucks to spend. So what can you buy that won't disappoint you? What alternatives are there to purchasing a telescope at all? Maybe you don't need a telescope right away. Maybe you're going to start with something different. Uh, what can you do that will help you make the stargazing experience as enjoyable as possible without any gear? Well, these are some of the questions we hope to answer for you tonight. Also tonight, on tonight's show, Mike will offer another Bino Bud treasure to enjoy. Awesome. Paul will provide us with another interesting Rosanna's fun fact. Yes. Great. Um, I'll have a quick look at what to watch for in, in this week's sky, and we'll have your wonderful photos submissions to share. And we're also going to have a short clip here from Stefan Picard of Cliff Yali Astronomy to talk about his Eclipse Retreat event coming up. So um, this is a family-friendly interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions here. Uh, these guys are in real time as well. And of course, I'd like to welcome back all those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. Yay! <laughs> Yay for Rogers. All right. <laughs> so let's get started then with tonight's program and a look at some equipment choices and ideas for beginners. So I think I'm going to be up first because I'm going to be offering a talk on just stargazing. Let me get my presentation open here first. Paul, you get the guitar handy, right? Yeah. Oh, you need it. Oh, uh, not right, maybe not right yet, but soon, probably. When you push the first button, shadow, moon, shadow. Let me go over to here. <laughs> awesome. I played out of tune because <laughs> that works. That's enough, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go get my spoons. 
<laughs> okay, uh, a little bit about stargazing. And my talk is, is a little bit along the line of, do you need to buy a piece of equipment at all? Um, and if you do buy a piece of equipment, there are a number of questions to ask yourself, like, what do I want it for? Well, it seems kind of obvious, but uh, am I looking at astrophotography or am I looking at visual astronomy? Um, do I am I looking for deep sky objects? Uh, is portability an issue for me? That's another big one. Um, and what's my budget? Of course, that's that's probably the biggest one of all. But if we don't have budget and we just want to take a look at the night sky, there are things we can do. Stargazing is easy. You just have to look up. But getting started can be daunting for some. There is a misconception that if you want to get into stargazing and see anything in the night sky, that you have to go out and spend money on high-tech equipment, such as the go-to telescopes and CCD cameras. What if you just want to start with very basic astronomy and you don't want to buy anything? Uh, what can you see just by stepping outside and looking up? Well, there are a number of steps that you can do. I'm going to cover just a few of the tips and tricks uh, to enjoy a night under the stars. Well, choosing a stargazing site, probably the number one for you. One of the first things you want to consider is where you're going to be observing. Uh, some lucky, uh, some are lucky enough to observe right from their own backyard. Uh, but if you're surrounded by tall buildings or you have to deal with a lot of light pollution, you may want to pick a different location. Now, Google Maps can be a great resource uh, for aerial views. You can choose the location that's dark yet safe and hopefully not too far from home. Another handy resource is a light pollution map, similar to the one that's provided on the website cleardarksky.com. So they have a picture of a, of a light uh, pollution map and you can choose areas based on the amount of light pollution. So hopefully the two of those will, will uh, coincide for you. Ah, dress for the occasion. When the sun goes down, it can get chilly, no matter what time of year. And to that, uh, add to that the joy of mosquitoes <laughs> or black flies or whatever uh, the animal happens to be and your evening out can become very unpleasant very quickly. The general rule for stargazers, though, is to bring along enough clothing to keep you warm if it was 10 degrees colder than it really is. And when you're stargazing, you spend long periods of time standing or sitting still. And since you're not moving around a lot, you're not generating much uh, extra heat. Uh, something else to consider is uh, warm footwear and waterproof, actually, too, because the grass can be very wet with the evening dew. And throw in some mosquito repellent in that carry bag that you're going to bring with you. Always handy to have a mosquito repellent of some type. Let your eyes dark adapt. Once you've arrived at your site, your eyes will need to dark adapt. Now, this process can take at least a half hour and involve your pupils dilating to allow for reduced light levels. Once they do, you won't believe how many more stars are visible. Uh, do avoid looking at your phone or in the direction of any bright lights. Instead of using your phone, a phone app to find your way around, you can look for free printable star charts online. There's lots of them and bring along a red flashlight for viewing them. And this will help you keep your dark adaptation. Now, comfort is key. Uh, there are more ways to be sure you're uh, focused on the night sky and not on your own discomfort. Uh, there's nothing worse, guys. I, I guess, you know, you might agree that uh, when you're trying to study something in the sky and you've got a, a backache or whatever, or you're cold, uh, it can take your attention away from it pretty quickly. As mentioned, uh, warm clothes are essential, including socks, like much warm socks. Uh, you could be standing on grass for a while. You should also consider bringing along maybe a comfortable chair. Uh, stargazing can be tough on the neck if you're looking up all the time. Uh, warm thermos of your favorite beverage also helps to take away the chill. And if you have uh, an extra one, bring along a blanket. You can always carry that stuff with you. It's really hard to find uh, afterwards, but bring it along and you'll have it in the car. Grab a photo for a memory. Most of us carry a pre pretty decent, uh, a precinct decent, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, pretty decent. I did this about two o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> uh, most of us carry a pretty decent camera with us on our phone and many on the DSLR setup. Uh, it's fun to capture a memory to share later. So experiment with settings and always try to use a tripod if possible. Uh, learn the constellations and asterisms. This is another good project. Uh, Constellations are our roadmaps to the night sky. Now we break the sky up into pieces and look inside those pieces for the treasures. Now it may seem overwhelming, but by taking one small section at a uh, time over many nights, you will become comfortable on where to look and what you're looking at. A man once said to me, uh, I can eat an elephant one bite at a time. So um, later as you step up to optical equipment, the knowledge you pick up by getting familiar with the constellations will become invaluable. 
and provide you with confidence when trying to find objects or sharing your views with others. Meteor showers. Meteor showers are those special events that everyone can enjoy. We have several each year and some with very favorable conditions this year. Uh, there are some really nice meteor shower expectations this year. All you need uh, there is a comfortable spot to view and some patience. Uh, they are always best to share with a friend or family member with each of you staring at a portion of the sky then shouting out when you see one. Uh, no experience or equipment necessary for those events for sure. And final thoughts, uh, stargazing can be a very rewarding and a humbling experience, actually. It's one of those hobbies that can be equally enjoyed alone or with a group, and it requires no experience or equipment to get started. Learn the constellations and asterisms. Decide whether being outside at night for hours at a time is really for you before you invest in expensive equip equipment. Bring along accessories to keep you comfortable. Take a few photos for keepsakes. Share the night sky with your friends and family and get them involved in stargazing nights as well. Learning together can make it much more enjoyable and really can be a very satisfying hobby. And if there is, uh, there is a clear, uh, and <laughs> it really can be a very satisfying hobby when there's a clear night waiting for you. And uh, all that is offered to you for free. So that's about what I was going to share. Free is a good price. <clears throat> yep. Price. Can't beat it. Yeah, good advice. So yeah, for me, that's that's where I see things. Oh, you nailed it. Yeah. Um, I've gone out and forgot bug spray, boy, and you know it when you forget your bug spray. <laughs> <laughs> we have been down the St. Rice Beach, Mike and I and Paul, I know, uh, down there many times with this little the little uh what do they call no see them, right? Yeah. Times, and uh, they'll just be hovering around you and Getting your eyepiece and cleaning them out of your eyeballs and around your oh, glasses. It's everywhere. Make your, uh, it's really irritating for the first hour after sunset, for sure. But, uh, yeah, keeping yourself comfortable to me is, is a big part of it. Uh, staying comfortable lets you allows you to focus more on what you're trying to see, but even if it is without equipment in the night sky. So. Well, I can say the biggest mistake is dressing to be warm because it does, even in the middle of the summer, boy, it can get nippy at night. <laughs> When you're just sitting still, and if the if the dew point is very is low, and you've got a lot of dew in the air, you can feel it you know, right to your bones, right? So, yeah, windy conditions too are something that you have to consider. I know that we we do get in, like especially at a place like Saints Rest Beach where it's wide open, so any breeze at all is, is a breeze enough to to shake your telescope and whatever. So, some kind of a shelter around you, some kind of a shroud around you is kind of a good idea as well. But anyway, that's uh, that's my thoughts. And if you'd had no gear. Um, Paul's going to talk to us about um, spending some money on some gear. Okay, I will. Well, um, what I'm going to talk about is um, purchasing a telescope, pros and cons, and I'm not going to do a presentation because it's it's just we've been doing this for so many years. It's really quite easy to, to split it up, split spit it out. But I am going to show you a a, a recommended telescope to get started with. So before I do that, um, some of the what brought this up in general was we were having a conversation last week, and I was saying to uh, uh, Mike and Chris, you know, I had a friend who wanted some advice on buying a telescope, and their budget was three hundred dollars. What could I buy? And being telescope snobs. <laughs> What do you mean three hundred dollars? What are you crazy? You can't buy crap for three hundred dollars. I, I said to myself, you know what? That's not fair. That's not fair to them. I mean, these people are trying to buy the meat. We're all trying to buy in the, on the shelves today. You can't afford it. How are you going to go spend, you know, thousand fifteen hundred dollars on a telescope? You just can't do it. So, in order to keep people in uh, enthused about the hobby, I decided to take a really hard look at what you could buy for three hundred dollars. The challenges that you face, um, we all do. And when we go to star parties, we do this. The, what's the number one thing we do, guys, at a star party when somebody comes to us with a telescope? What's the number one thing we do first? Yeah, there's so many things we do. <laughs> well, I, we, it's, I know we, it's, the red, it's the red dot finder. Yeah. 
that's the number one thing that we do. It's the number one cheapest piece of crap that you will get on a telescope. And so the telescope I'm going to talk to you about tonight does not need one. Secondly, uh, what are the most common struggles people have when setting up a telescope? Well, <clears throat> the red dot finder certainly is one of them. And if I'm using a certain kind of mount, I have to do a polar alignment. And I don't know how to do a polar alignment. I don't even know what a polar alignment is. I haven't even learned what the pole star is. So how do you expect someone to do that kind of, uh, uh, you know, actually a, a little bit of a technical setup to get their telescope set up when they've never done it before and they've never even seen it. So that's one of the things that on this telescope I'm going to show you that you don't have to do. Um, now, what do you see? after you've set up your telescope over the two or three nights that you try to figure it out to get it up and running and you start looking at stuff how soon do you run out of things to look at well let's think about it for a minute i don't know anything about the night sky so i'm going to look at the moon because i see that all the time if i'm smart enough to get the right filter maybe i'll take a look at the sun and then i'll look at jupiter and then i'll try to find that little yellow dot we call mars and then maybe I'll look at a few things. Then after that, what do I do? I don't even know where to look. So the telescope I'm gonna talk about is gonna show you over 40,000 items that you can see. Um, and what do you know about what you're looking at? So all of a sudden it says, okay, I'm gonna find M45. First of all, what the heck's M45? I don't know. What's an M45? Mike, what's M45? About an M44. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's pallades isn't it yeah yes yes so what's the pallades i don't know well it's a group of stars so what's so important about these group of stars well it's a cluster but what else is special about this particular group of stars well it's got reflection nebula around it and what does reflection nebula do of course it reflects from the the, the brightness of the stars and it gives you this nice gorgeous blue cloudy dusty stuff all around it if yes. you're standing out there with the dobsonian dobsonian telescope plunked on the ground you finally found out where pallades was because it was the summer when you were looking for it when it wasn't even in the sky to begin with which is another thing this telescope will do is tell you what's in the sky at the time of the year that you're looking um and you're trying to figure out what pallades is well that's one of the most frustrating things because eventually you just run out of things to look for because you don't know what to look for to begin with because you're standing on the ground with a, either a manual telescope which you were told by old school thinkers get the manual telescope and learn the night sky which is great advice absolutely but if you want a more positive experience right from the get-go the telescope i'm going to talk about will probably give you that so without any further ado, I'm going to actually now show you that telescope that I think um, for $300, which is probably in the, re in the reach of most people, um, this telescope I want to show, I've got to find it first, so just bear with me for one second. I'm going to try to make, I think I can pin you, Paul. Okay, yeah, I was going to just hang on until I find where I put it. Uh, it should be right here, I think. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Share screen. And I am going to share this one. And tell me when you, oh, that's the wrong one. There's the one. Tell me if when you see that, that screen. Yes. You see it? Okay. So the first thing I'm going to recommend for anybody who has never bought a telescope before is if you are uh able to join an astronomy club that's the first thing that you want to do is join an astronomy club because that's where every beginner goes to learn and get on the right road to getting to where you want to go also joining an astronomy club will allow you to see some uh, very very nice equipment that eventually that if you are going to stay in the hobby and you may have something to aspire to it's also a place where everybody's got different telescopes and different gear different binoculars different everything and you have a chance to have a look at all those and look at the pros and cons and what might fit your um astronomy um uh future for your you know for yourself and what you may want to look at 
So that's the first thing I recommend that you do. The page that I'm looking at that I'll recommend you go to is the Celestron page. Uh, you just dial in celestron.com and you'll go to their page. That is the most invaluable, one of the most invaluable sites you'll ever go to. Not only is it a retail home for all the stuff they sell, but there are so many tutorials on that page. Uh, anything you ever want to know about anything is actually on that page. If it's not on the page, there's links to take you places that you can find the information. So that Celestron page is one of the best places that you can go. Now, when I go to it, how you navigate to what I want to show you is you simply go to telescopes. And then you can go over $500, under $500, clearance, view all. So it's got all kinds of stuff you can look at, all kinds of stuff on astronomy, sport optics, microscopes, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to look at telescopes and uh, under $500. And there is one specific telescope that I think is probably the best value that I have seen in a long, long, long time. I'm going to see if I can bring it up. And here it is here. And this one's called the StarSense Explorer LT114AZ Smartphone Apt Enabled Newtonian Reflector Telescope. Now that's a lot to bring in for a name for a telescope, isn't it? But that's exactly what this device does. It's not just here's your telescope, here's how much it is, take it home and good luck to you. This is really a system as far as I'm concerned. So let's look at some of the, some of the advantages and the, some of the things that you can do with this system. The first one is, of course, um, it's a Newtonian type of a reflector. And these kind of reflectors, when you get them from the factory, they are set up quite well. So do you have to learn how to collimate? Probably over time you will. But for the first little while, I wouldn't even worry about it because these are really set up quite well right from the get go. So it's not something that you would have to do very often. So that's the, one of the reasons why I'd recommend this. If you were to get into a more precise instrument, you would be collimating more. So, but that's something you can do down the road if you decide you want to stay in the hobby. So it's a Newtonian telescope. The mount that it sits on is the alt as mount. So it's not that German equatorial mount that you got to do a polar alignment with. Just plunk it on the ground and you just basically take it and point it left or right or up and up and down, just like you would a Dobsonian. So it's really, really simple to use. No magic to learn there at all. Also, um, it has the StarSense software built in. This to me is probably the most important part of this telescope um, for a number of reasons. So the first reason we talked about was, you know, what discourages astronomers? Well, it's that, that little red dot finder, which is a pain in the potatoes. And uh, it's the kind of thing where you know, if you don't get it right, or if you don't know how to line it up, it could be the most frustrating thing in the world. And I'll guarantee you, if you have one, you've replaced the battery a gazillion times because you always leave it on, forget to turn it off. So it's one of those things that you're forever kicking you in the butt every time you turn around. So it's not a great thing to have. By using the StarSense uh, operation, you do not need the red dot finder at all. Because what this star sense allows you to do is it allows you to uh, plate solve all of your objects in the sky. Plate solving is just basically is in the star sense software. They have these little maps of, of wherever you are in the uh, on the wherever your location is. Because you're using your phone, it knows where you are. It knows the time of day and it knows the date. So it already knows all that stuff. And then all you got to do is simply punch in what you want to see. And then based on what your telescope is looking at and pointing at, there's a little mirror on this little telescope that's, that you, sit your, uh, you set your smartphone over top of. So whatever your telescope sees, your phone sees. So if your phone is looking at, say, M45, the Pallades, then automatically it's going to go to the software, it's going to check the database, and it's going to say, oh, you know what, you're a little bit too far to the left. Use those little arrows and move your scope to the right. Oh, oh, you went a little too far, go back to the left. So it's just a matter of following the arrows. It is the simplest way to get your way around the night sky. The second thing that's really cool about this is once you're there, and like we talked about, what do you, what do you see once you found all those things? What do you see and what do you know about it? Well, nothing, aha. 
with this particular uh, setup, it's going to tell you all kinds of things in, about what that is, and it'll play it back on your cell phone for you to listen. So if you're once you're looking at the object, you don't have to try to get a book out or try to figure out what it is. It's going to tell you over your phone, and you can listen to it while you're looking at the, the object. That's a fantastic feature. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The next thing is, um, everybody in the family pretty much now has a cell phone. So we as old school astronomers or old school amateurs have always said, well, you know, take your telescope out and learn the night sky. Well, you know what, for some people that might be a little bit boring or frustrating. So what this will do, as opposed to trying to find stuff in the sky, and I'm not discouraging learning the sky, that's not what I'm going with this. I'm talking about people who have never had a telescope before, who want to avoid the frustrations, who are on a limited budget and want to have these really positive moments when first entering into astronomy so that you will move forward in, with astronomy. That's what I'm talking about, what this will do for you. So most of us in the family have our own smartphone. So there's not anybody in the family that can't use this telescope because you, everybody's got the cell, the cell phones. So that's the nice thing about that too. Now, let me see what else has got on here that I want to talk about. Um, oh yeah. It is lightweight, simple to pick up, simple to carry outside and simple to put away. So it's very, very, very small, very lightweight. And um, it might not be, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar telescope. We know that, but what it is, it gives you um, really, really good, clear views of what it is that you're looking at. Um, it comes with two eyepieces, so you don't have to worry about buying all this extra stuff. Because sometimes when you buy a telescope all on its own, uh, some of the higher end ones, well, then you got to buy all the accessories that you need to get it up and running. This basically comes with all that. The app that you need. Uh, the, the software that you need is free from Celestron. So you can download that for free on your phone. So you don't have to pay any more for that. So basically you're paying the $300 for this telescope. You have it home, you download the software that you need and you can have an immediate positive re, um, experience with your, with your new telescope. And if somebody, like I say, it's something that everybody in the whole family can use. So this is the telescope that I would recommend based on what I researched for something that's simple, easy to use, fun to use, positive experience right away. And once you use it once, if you're not at your telescope and you're wondering about the stars, you've got that app in your phone. So you have your phone with you all the time. So anytime you got an astronomy um, desire, you wanna look at something with astronomy, what's up in the sky tonight? I can't wait to go home and see this. You don't have to wait, it's on your phone. So when you have five minutes, just open up your planetary software, plan your evening even before you get home. You can do all that stuff with this telescope and the software that comes with it. $300, that is my recommendation for anybody starting in the hobby. That's awesome. awesome. That's a good, good little setup. Yeah, it's a great little scope, I think, for the money and for someone who's never picked up a telescope before. What a, yeah. what a very um, uh, unintimidating way to get started. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, back in the day <laughs> when we were dog guys and, uh, you know, you go out and set a dog outside, it did take a while to learn where even a half a dozen things were in the sky. Yeah. And I might have found them and then pat myself on the back. But then the next night I go out, I couldn't find them again or you know, a week later or whatever, when, the, when, it, when you had the next clear sky. So it did make it tough. Uh, but this, but, the, but now, like you said, the technology is there now. We might as well use it. Yeah, embrace it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, you know, it, it, like I was talking about being comfortable. The idea is to try to enjoy your experience, right? So that you'll want to go out and do it again. If it becomes a lot of work, you're not going to do it. No, that's right. Um, the most active telescope is, I have is that little one over there, a little tabletop, because it's easiest to take outside. Uh, and you know, I get fifteen or twenty minutes. It's not a big hassle. You got to drag one of the bigger ones out. You're going to be out there for a little while longer, and you got to mm -hmm. make sure you have that time. But but yeah, that, that's the idea of the of the, uh, of the technology today. Is you, you, might as well, you might as well use it. It's there yeah. for you. Uh, Winston is asking a few questions on here. He said, have you, have you uh, used this telescope yourself, Paul? No. No. Okay. I know uh, I could. I know I could easily. I know some people who have. 
and yeah. uh, it's like out of the box and in a couple of minutes you're up and running right uh would this work in a Bortle seven to nine sky yes yes okay. yes any telescope will because you can always look at the moon it's bright you can always look at you can look at the moon from downtown toronto you can yeah. see Jupiter from downtown toronto you can Lines. see star clusters bright ones from downtown toronto so you can use it anywhere yeah, yeah. uh is there a carry vague i don't think there is <laughs> I don't know about that. You have to just look on the site and see what accessories I recommend. Yep. Ah, my option comes with a carry bag. <laughs> <laughs> I got it already. All right, thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Okay, okay. and we're going we're gonna to scoop over to Mike now, who's going to tell us, uh, hey, you don't need a telescope. No, actually. Uh, if you, if you uh, have that same $300 and you're going to buy yeah. something, Mike's suggesting like, not a telescope, but something else. I'll you get that same lot of cast that you, you want to spend, and you're looking at, you know, okay, telescope, yes, I like that idea. But is there another option that might be in around the same price? Yes. And I'm going to just quickly show you here, if I get the right screen. Uh, I believe this is it. Let me know if this pops up. Yes, it's there. So binoculars, and the specific binoculars I'm talking about are Celestron 25 by 70 which means they're 25 power by 70 millimeter objective lens. So if you bought the binoculars for $132 on Amazon, and then you bought a binocular mount to stick them on a tripod, which is $36, and the tripod itself for a 60-inch tripod, you're running $29.99. Guess what? The total adds up to $198.69 plus tax, and you're going to spend all of $228.49 for a nice pair of 70 millimeter 25 power binoculars, with a tripod and the mount to mount it on the tripod. Now, the advantage to these as well, number one, you're looking in stereo. Okay, you're using both eyes, which is nice. You can use the binoculars during the daytime or nighttime. You don't necessarily just have to use them at night. Neither do a telescope either, but binoculars you can take to the beach and stuff like that. It's kind of hard to be you're just, you know, looking around the beach with a telescope during the daytime. Uh, they're nice and big. Like I said, they're 70 millimeter objective lens, so it lets in a lot of light. And if I was just to pop over to the next slide, I'll show you some comparison. If you were to buy an 80 millimeter, 500 millimeter focal length reflector, or sorry, refractor, and put in a 20 millimeter eyepiece, guess what? It gives you 25 power. If you were to take a 114 millimeter, 500 millimeter focal length reflector, like Paul was looking at, with a 20 millimeter eyepiece, guess what? 25 power. Or these travel scopes that you see Celestron has them. They're nice little scopes, a travel scope that you put in the backpack and you can carry it with you. They're 70 millimeter with a 500 millimeter focal length refractor. Guess what? With a 20 millimeter eyepiece, it's 25 power. So what are you getting? You're getting a 25 power pair of binoculars, right? <laughs> and it's exactly the same thing, only you're basically strapping two telescopes together into one and you're looking with stereo vision. The only disadvantage that I find over what Paul was showing you. Now, some of these smaller scopes, like the 114 millimeter reflectors, also have a built in Barlow to give you a thousand millimeter focal length, but it's putting another piece of glass in the way, as far as I'm concerned. And anytime you stick another piece of glass in the way, it can degrade your views a little bit, where the binoculars are just basically straight through. But you can't change the eyepieces on a pair of binoculars. You can change the eyepieces definitely in a telescope, and you can drop in lower. Uh, uh, millimeter eyepiece is like a 10 and that's going to boost your power to 400 or 40 over 20 or 25 and so on and so forth. Now you can also mount a cell phone on your binoculars standing up and you can download software like uh, Sky Portal and or Stellarium and you hit the compass button and it will move you around the sky to the objects you want to look at as well. And again, you can push uh, on Sky Portal the audio portion that will tell you about the object you're looking at and all that kind of good stuff. So there is an advantage to having binoculars, right, over buying a telescope right away for the first time. You can use the same software. It doesn't have the star set software, so it doesn't have uh, plate solving, but it's close enough <laughs> with a large enough field of view that you're going to be able to see your target anyway. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's all I wanted to say about that. So there, options. Awesome, Mike. Yeah, I mean, another thing about binoculars too is that it gives you correct orientation, right? It's yeah. Not right, it's not upside down. It's it's what you see is what you get. Like just, 
I, they're both just as good. It's mm. just another option for around the same price range. That's all mm. it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's something you want to be holding in your hand all night either. You want to definitely mount them on a tripod. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Tripod has to be the case because they're fairly heavy, the 25 by 70s. Yeah. 10 yeah. by 50 is even nice. I mean, they're, they're smaller, they're portable, they're a lot less money, but. Yep. They don't give you as nice a view as you get through the 25 by 70s, of course, right? Yeah, and you can get uh, like 20 by 80s. Again, it was at that large aperture. You can start picking up fainter objects. I, I love uh, okay. showing people the, the Milky Way, you know, like in, in the summertime Milky Way. You know, you show them a little patch up by uh, Cygnus. <laughs> <laughs> in that little part of the sky there where it's, you know, really thick with stars and they're looking up at it and they give them a pair of binoculars to take a look at it and it just blows them away what they what they get a chance to see. So they're great for the Milky Way view as well, binoculars. They're they're great for planets. Um, you know, they're great for the moon. The moon's beautiful through them. The Pleiades cluster is beautiful through them. And drama yeah. galaxy, all the wide field things are, are really nice through them. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And that was what I was looking at that kind of caught my eye was the fact that these smaller telescopes, most of them have 500 millimeter focal lengths. Yeah. Well, with a 20 millimeter eyepiece, you're getting the same magnification as you are through a pair of uh, 20 power binoculars. Mm. So why not, you know, look in stereo instead of one eye <laughs> and mm. see the same object because yeah. it's going to look the same size. Yeah. So. Yeah. Unless you, put, unless you put binos in the telescope and that doesn't work. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's a different yeah. take on it. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So, our, 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 yeah, so that's our call and stuff tonight. Uh, mine was more or less on no money, and Paul's was a, a nice uh, scope there for three hundred bucks. Um, Mike's uh, the alternate choice is for for three hundred bucks. So hopefully that'll give you some ideas. You can go back and review this later on and, and uh, see what we brought up again. But um, who was mentioning comment here? Uh, Kevin says haven't seen this one before. Does the smartphone look down the eyepiece to image and plate solve? Uh, no, no how, how it works is, is there's a there's a mirror. Uh, it's just almost like having an off axis mirror for guiding. So what happens is there's uh, the image that you see through the telescope down near the uh, uh, where the phone mounts. There's a mirror there that takes a, a, a that's in the path and it sends that right over to where your phone is. So your phone's actually looking at a mirror, um, if you will of what the telescope sees right so it's just a mirror that's off to the side that your your phone is looking at so wherever you happen to point your telescope your phone sees those stars right. so that's why um it can it always knows where you are because it always see has the star reference to go to the catalogs that it needs to yeah. say okay what am i looking at in the sky right now and then based on that information it tells you it gives you the arrows to say you know what you're too far to the left Move to right. the right. right, or you too far north. Move to the south, right. because you're moving everything in all dazzy. So it's just looking at a mirror, and then it's just like you do when you're using your um, eyepiece adapter for your cell phone, is you have to line your cell phone because it's the same thing. It's actually one of the next YZ uh, holders. It just doesn't have all the stuff on it, but you put your phone on it, and then you actually have to center it up over that mirror so that your camera is looking directly at the mirror. Once it's in place, then it stays there all night long. It's nice and firm. It doesn't get knocked out. And then from there, wherever you move your telescope, your tele your tel your the software uh, knows what your phone is looking at, and therefore it knows where it is in the sky. And whatever you're trying to see, based on that information, it can tell you which way to go. Right. Yeah. May I make one suggestion? You, use your use your second cell phone on the telescope. You don't want to be out in the night of viewing and have your telephone ring. And have to take it off your scope to answer it and talk to people. <laughs> you leave, <laughs> leave that telephone I'm, on the scope. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, this is why, like I was saying, everybody in the in the place in the family usually has a cell phone anyway. So here's another thing: buy an XYZ, strap it to the to the eyepiece of the telescope. So if you're looking at the moon or something that's bright and big, then just put your phone on it. You can also do uh, some astro photos. Uh, with your cell phone, like like Chris does in all the time when he's out doing his uh, outreach, and uh, they can automatically just send it to their friends while they're doing it. Right. It's, and there's just so many advantages to that system. 
Yeah. And you can do that with binoculars too. <laughs> I mean, the plate solving part does not use any data, right? So you don't need, no. you don't. No. Solve the no. Active no. Program, so. Okay, that's uh, that's great. I guess we covered as much as we can. So let's move on to uh, a vinyl bud. Vinyl bud. What vinyl bud got first this week? You know I'm pushing binoculars because of vinyl bud, right? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Binocular target of the week this week by Bino <laughs> Bud is. I gotta get it in there. <laughs> Davy's dog. Oh, okay. remember him? Yeah. Well, no. Davy's dog is easy enough to find. Between the Hyades and Pallades lies a star group just visible to the unaided eye. Because Davy's dog is pretty large, you can observe this asterism best with binoculars. <laughs> sure. Look for a Canis Major constellation shape. Davy's dog lies just north of the northern constellation Taurus the Bull. And it's John Davis, for whom the asterism is named, he saw it as a beagle, believe it or not. So how do I find it in the sky? Well, if you went out at 9 o'clock tonight, it's dark enough, and look 270 or directly west and looked up, you'll see the Pallades and come down, you see the Hyades cluster and the bright star Aldebaran. You just in between those two and up a little bit and go look at this. There's your doggy. Right there. Oh, sure. You can't miss him. Looks like a balloon dog. <laughs> yeah, you, well, that works. Yeah. Call it the balloon <laughs> dog. He saw a beagle. Yes, you see a balloon dog. I like it. <laughs> what will you see? Well, you know, this is the area in the sky. There's a Pleiades cluster. And there's El Debron, the high 80s down in here. And there's Davy's dog right in there. There's his nose and his body and his little legs sticking down. Won't look quite look like that, but it will look like this in 20 by 50 or 10 by 50 binoculars. And again, there's the head comes down, look, kind of makes a little S, and then the body goes back and the legs come down. So it's a huge object. I mean, this thing takes up 50% of your field of view in 10 by 50 binoculars. Compared to the full moon, oh, seven, eight full moons across in length. <laughs> so it's a big object. Once you get up there and put your binoculars up on it, you definitely can't miss it. it you, you'll jump out and hopefully you'll see a balloon duck. And astronomy in the maritimes. Uh, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> and that's binocular target of the week by Bino no Bud. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Arf, arf. <laughs> arf, arf, yeah. How does that feel? Rough, rough. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what a dog with a hair lip mark mark <laughs> mark 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 <laughs> i had a smart dog one time he pointed at a tree and i said what's that he said bark bark there you go <laughs> so with a piece of sandpaper you know, i said how's that feel he said rough rough anyway. you know how my Dude. brother nick got his name no father was in the bathroom shaving one time oh <laughs> uh. Oh, I've got a neck. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go down with the show. <laughs> I don't have a brother named Nick, by the way. I just made this it up. the comedy hour. Guys. <laughs> We're trying to be serious here. Kind of. Okay. Uh, how about Rosanna's fun fact next? Oh, yeah. Sure. Is it back for us? Yeah. Thrills. Where to go? She just disappeared on me. There she is. Now I just got to find. The fun fact, well, I must have turned it off. Oh, there it is. There it's flashing at me. Okay, there we go. Oops, just hang on a sec. My mouse is not uh, functioning correctly. So, we gotta buy, we gotta take up a donation here for Paul. Can we take up a donation, Paul? Yeah, Paul needs a new mouse, <laughs> one that he will not, he promises not to abuse like he does this one. Hmm. Okay, so let's see if we can't get this working. I'm going to share my screen and we are going to have this week's. <laughs> Rosanna's Fun Fact. Yay. Welcome back, Rosanna, to another great week of fun facts. And I must say, I have to thank Rosanna very much for taking her long weekend and doing a fun fact for us. So, Rosanna, Thank you very, very much for that. We really appreciate yes, thank it. You. All right. Now, 
So Rosanna starts by saying, hi, Paul. People tend to group other people into categories. As a species, humans love to define things. So whether you find coincidences delightful, ticklish happenings, or more in the uh, law of truly large numbers camp, which states that in large populations, any weird event is likely to happen. Life can be definitely strangely serendipitous at times. Often it is a ladder of discoveries that intertwine a bit like. This is the house that Jack built. A cumulative and rhyming song. Does anybody remember that one? No, probably not. So here we have a photograph. And this is, let's start with the beautiful Hetty Lamar. Now Hetty was an actress in the 1940s, but she was also a math whiz and an inventor. She was a hostess to many military parties given by her first of five husbands at which she acquired a lot of information about technology, especially radio communications. She teamed up with composer George uh, Antheo, whose signature piece, Ballet Mechanique, involves synchronizing 16 pianos, which is no small feat. Yes, the piece is available on YouTube. You can actually hear this, this song that they actually composed. Let me show you what it looked like. Let me just show you the, the drawing. Let's get that up there. There we go. Um, uh, the two of them started a conversation about changing frequencies. She had already started changing husbands by this time, which led to a shared patent for a device for frequency hopping, which was a way to uh, prevent signals to radio guided torpedoes from being jammed. So this was the actual um, diagram of what that was. Their joint invention, invention was used, uh, invention uh, rather, used a me mechanism similar to a piano player roles to synchronize the changes between the 88 frequencies, not coincidentally. This is also the standard number of keys on a piano. Mike, we talked about it earlier. Remember I said it was gonna come up? There it is. Let's fast forward 30 years to Stephen Hawking's announcement of his then astonishing theory that black holes may not be completely black and they could actually emit some radiation from their surrounding e, uh, event horizon, which in turn would allow a black hole to be detected. So John O'Sullivan, an electrical engineer, reasoned that uh, what was needed was to make a radio telescope imaging sharper or images, sorry, sharper. He led a group of scientists to try and track radio waves from black holes, a more developed expansion on the early form of spread spectrum communication technology invented by Lamar and Antheil and of course others. John's black hole detector failed due to all the other radio noise in the cosmos. It was unable to distinguish the feeble Hawking radiation amidst all the noise enter the Lovell radio telescope at the Jodrell Bank in the UK and others like it. The jumble of wavelengths picked up by a radio telescopes is a bit like a musical chord where many different notes are played at the same time. What's needed to distinguish one wave from another is a Fourier transform. When I looked up what is a Fourier transform in simple terms, here's what the answer was. The Fourier transform is a mathematical function that decomposes a waveform, which is a function of time, into frequencies that make it up. The result produced by the Fourier transform is a complex valued function of frequency. The Fourier transform is able to de deconstruct a complex wave into several simple waves, a bit like hearing a major C chord on the piano and working out that it must be composed of three individual notes. C, E, and G together make up that chord. Joseph Fourier actually came up with a process in the 1820s, but back to uh, John O'Sullivan, John's failure actually led to the creation of Wi-Fi. In essence, we send and receive digital data by radio communications between a device and a base station, such as your home internet router. If you wanna be uh, really accurate, it uses parts of the electromagnetic spectrum in the microwave region, which are shorter and higher frequency than radio waves. Now back to the black holes. 
we can now hear them due to being able to measure the pressure of the gas from a black hole up against neighboring gas. I think I'm going to try to play this. Hang on. Bear with me. Well, sounds ghostly, doesn't it? <laughs> That's cool. It is very cool. Okay, let me find the rest of the notes here. Hang on. Back to where I was. Let me just uh, hold on there. I lost it when I lost that um, page. You just bear with me for a second. There we go. And there we go. Okay, I'm back. You need guitars, Mike? Uh, yeah, you need. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, you should have the guitar tonight. Now back to black holes, and so we can hear them. So that's what we just played. So NASA releases audio of what a black hole sounds like. On the, on Sunday, NASA released an audio clip that represents actual sound waves emanating from the enormous black hole at the center of the Perseus Galaxy Cluster. And of course, and that, that's what you play. So you can look that up on YouTube. That's where that came from. A spectroscope, which is the, which, oh, what's that? <laughs> A spectroscope, which uh, measures wavelengths of electro electromagnetic radiation, is used to measure the gas. Astronomers created the audible sound by recording the pressure waves that the black hole sent through a cluster's hot gas. In the original form, those waves cannot be heard by the human ear, so scientists extracted the sound waves and scaled them up by 57 and 58 octaves. And let me just go to the next photo. There we go. Let me show you this. On uh, uh, April the 6th, the James Webb Telescope released the news that it has discovered the oldest black hole in the universe, a cosmic monster 10 million times heavier than our sun. I wonder if it sounds the same as a black hole in the Perseus Galaxy Cluster. Hmm. So this is an artist interpretation. I can't wait to see and or hear the official James Webb telescope release. Well, that was a long history to connect the dots, but I still have one question to show. <laughs> Does house that Jack built have Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, and I gotta tell you that is this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey. That was amazing. I don't know where she gets her reach. I don't even know how she gets her topics, but my but the time she must have been just looking for a topic, but the research behind is just incredible. well, you know, like she's uh she's really, you know, more than just a gazer. You know, she really yeah. she studies this stuff. It's amazing what yeah. she comes up with. And she has uh, she has some people in her life that are uh, that are uh, professionals. So okay, yeah, yeah. No, she always puts out an excellent uh, topic for sure. Oh, it's just amazing, it's just mm. amazing. But just that information alone, with the technology we have now and how we're able to break things down on and what was once impossible is now possible. It's unbelievable. Wait so anyway, thank you, Rosanna. Awesome, yeah. fun fact. awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go from there then to a, a quick what's up talk. We're getting a little bit late, I guess, but we're really are going to run a little bit late tonight, guys, just to let you know. Uh, might not need music. Paul, just hang on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. I'm up. I'm playing it really badly for on purpose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, what's up this week? Uh, let's have a quick look. And, uh, we'll get Paul away from the guitar for a minute or two. Um, of course. In the background? Yeah, of course this. Hey, look, less than one year away now. Yeah. We are uh, we are at less than one day. 
<laughs> uh, from the total solar eclipse. That's going to be right over our end of the country. We're going to have the best view in the country, probably right over our province. Oh, look at that. Well, um, yeah, it's going to be uh, an excellent sunny day. I've already put my order in. You guys have, I, I assume, as well. Um, we'll get uh, a couple of minutes of totality through parts of the province anyway. From St. John, I think we're at 98.5%, something like that. Very close. 2025, there's another one coming up that's uh, almost as, as nice as this one. But anyway, this is one to watch for. You're going to hear a whole lot about this coming up in the next little while. The news media is going to pick it up uh, pretty quickly as we approach. Uh, all week this week, our view to the west. Our evening sky continues to offer the familiar winter constellations, um, although they're quickly making their way uh, away for our spring and summer ones. Uh, Orion and friends are, are closer to the horizon earlier in the evening now, and they are making way for galaxy season. But there's still lots to enjoy for sure. Hey, and I can see where Venus is in that picture. Davy's dog is chasing the ball of Venus. Davy's dog is chasing the ball. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, yes he is. Right yes. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, tonight through Wednesday evening, Venus and the Pleiades. Um, uh, this will be a great week to keep an eye on the western sky uh, after sunset as brilliant Venus greets the beautiful Pleiades star cluster in Taurus. Now, the Venus is the third brightest object in our sky behind the sun and our moon. And over the next number of nights, it will appear uh, within a binocular view of the Pleiades. Looking like a mini dipper, uh, the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, is an open star cluster containing about 3,000 stars and is one of the brightest star clusters in our sky. It resides about 444 light years away and is dominated by some hot blue and luminous stars that have formed between 75 to 150 million years ago. Just little babies, actually. Stellar nursery. Um, on Tuesday night, uh, Mercury is at its greatest eastern elongation. So Tuesday evening, evening, little Mercury is located at its most eastern point that it can reach in our evening sky in its orbit around the sun. Mercury will still be climbing higher for a couple more evenings after that, but will quick, quickly drop to a position below the horizon as it heads toward what we call inferior conjunction, or that point that places it roughly between us and the sun on May the 1st. Um, third uh, Thursday evening, um, third quarter moon. Our third quarter moon arrives at 6, 11, a, that should be PM, I believe. No, it is AM, ADT on Thursday. Our uh, third quarter moon spends most of the time in our daytime sky and provides a nice view of our celestial neighbor. Uh, it's a great time of the cycle to check out the moon with binoculars when temperatures are more pleasant, which they are on our daytime sky now. So no excuse, get out there and have a look. Saturday, April 15th, moon and Saturn. Uh, look to the southeast early Saturday morning to spot the waning crescent moon as it uh, greets the ring beauty Saturn. Both are the prettiest of sights to behold in a telescope and also in binoculars. Well, you can get, uh, can't get the rings of Saturn in binoculars, but you can tell that it's an oblong kind of a shape. Uh, Sunday, though, moon sits very near Saturn. Uh, another view of Saturn and our moon greets us just before sunrise next to Sunday. And that's about... All we're going to see. Uh, <laughs> I love that. I don't know where that That's came awesome. from. That. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty rare. It quacks me up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ducky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then I'm going to go from there to our photos, I guess. So, Paul, I might need some music. <laughs> uh -oh. oh no, I just need a minute or two to get things open, but all right, well, me. And all me. Can't be playing songs people know. Yeah, oh, it's not even know. Oh, I got one. Rust in the truck. <laughs> yeah. All we have is rust in the truck. Okay. Oh, really? <laughs> Escalator to heaven. <laughs> right, um, My stars on ice next. Yeah. <laughs> the mass stars on 45, remember that? <laughs> stars on 45. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They never come up with stars on CD, did they? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, tonight's, uh, tonight's photo sessions is being brought to us by uh, Sky Experience 2024, which is being put on by Cliff Valley Astronomy. Um, his bit of experience that he's offering uh, for the sol to sol the solar eclipse of 2024. And I'm going to offer a little bit of a video here, if I can get it up on the page properly. Just give me one second. Well, I'm going to open it up. I mean, I want to get it on the right page. Let's uh, stop sharing. And I'm going to try to share the screen. Oh, Winston's got a cigarette lighter going for the songs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we see uh, Stefan there? Yep. Okay, let's get this uh, look played. It's uh, about four minutes long. So he just wants to talk a little bit about uh, the sky experience that he's going to be offering uh, in 2024. Here we go. Hi, I'm Stefan, the owner and CEO of Cliff Valley Astronomy, along with my partners, Exa Group Canada. We're the creators of the event called Sky Experience 2024, and we are in Dope Town at the beautiful Storytown Cottages, and exactly a year from now, you'll see the sun where it's in the sky right now. The moon will start moving in front of it. It'll take over two hours, and at the point of totality, we're going to enjoy three minutes and about 17 seconds, which is almost 200 seconds of totality. So this meant to give you an idea how high the sun and the moon will be in the sky exactly a year from now today. So join me, and I'll go show you uh, a little bit about Storytown and the... Hi, my name is Richard Zarowski, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sky Experience 2024 Total Solar Eclipse. The time's closing fast. It's just one short year away. I am so excited to be part of the festivities, celestial and otherwise, and to be talking with and presenting to astronomers from all around the world who are coming to New Brunswick, one of the best kept secrets in the world, to view one of the most amazing and spectacular celestial events a total solar eclipse. It's going to be an unforgettable time and event packed with lectures, talks, socializing, and so much more. See you when the sky goes dark. Hey guys, I'm gonna show you one of the kitchenette suites at Storytown Cottages. We have one available. And as you can see, you see, you have all there you have behind the bed is a three-piece bathroom. You have a nice sitting area, a little living room area. And as you turn around, your view is up the Miramichi River. Hi, everyone. My name is Trevor Jones, and I am going to get you excited about astrophotography. I'll explain how you can take pictures of galaxies, nebulae, and more right from your own backyard. I'll cover everything from building a basic deep sky astrophotography kit to image processing tips and techniques to get the most out of your photos. My goal is to get you on the right track so that you too can enjoy a hobby that creates an even deeper connection to the night sky. Hey guys, we're at the Hilltop Cottage of Storytown Cottages. This is the two bedroom Cottage I've been uh, talking to you and you've seen on the brochure. As you can see, it's got a wide open concept for a living room, kitchen, dining room. And you have two bedrooms right here and a three piece bathroom in there. And it's really cozy and very, everything that you could ask for. The wood stove it adds a nice element to it. And this is a great place to be spending a couple nights during the uh, Sky Experience 2024. Hi, my name is Ashley Northcott and I'm going to be speaking at the Sky Experience 2024 event about the issue of light pollution and the impact it has on nature, humans and the environment. I will share simple actions you can do at home to ensure you're using lighting responsibly, as well as share information about how to get involved in protecting the night sky. I'm looking forward to experiencing the solar eclipse surrounded by people who appreciate the night sky as much as I do. So uh, still at the hilltop, guys, and uh, as you know, I said there's some cottages that have a hot tub. Here's the setting for this one. We got one room left here, so book now. You got a hot tub, you can enjoy all day. You got the comfortable amenities inside the cottage. The view of the river is fantastic. And this will be your home base during our retreat. Sky Experience 2024.
Hi, greetings from the Jersey Shore. I'm Lisa Ann Fanning. And I'm Rob Fanning. We're looking forward to birding with you along the Miramichi River. Join us for Sky Experience 2024 when we learn what happens when the skies go dark. Do the birds stop chirping? Also, learn how astronomical events affect animal behavior. Or just join us for a bird walk. We're looking forward to seeing you there. 2024. Bye. There, and that's uh, that's what yeah. the all about. So, um, wish uh, Stefan at Cliff Valley Astronomy good luck with everything there, and uh, yeah. I'm sure it's going to be a great experience for all the people who are attending. Indeed. Okay. I'm going to go from here now to um, the photos that I had uh, running. I think I had some photos running here. Oh, I'm sure we did. There they are. No, no, not, not good. <laughs> <They're> somewhere. <laughs> Just a minute. No. The sound of silence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get back to some photos here. Uh, let me move ahead to that one. Here. Okay. And I'll start to show my screen again. I'm going to scare this one. This one. There. There you go. There we go. Oh, okay. Hey. Okay. So we got this one from Carol Bean. Carol says uh, this is uh, Venus and Mercury Saturday night. Look at that. Venus and Mercury. There it yes, is. Sir. They're both there. Oh, here there far far. Nicely done. And she's got this one of the uh, the Gibbous Moon in the church steeple in St. Stephen. Nice very capture. Very yeah. Very nice. Well done. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Pat Terrio has bought himself a dwarf too smart telescope. Oh. Yeah. It's pretty interesting cool. stuff, I guess. Um, he showed me this uh, image, which was a one second image. That one? No, oh, this one. Yeah. So this one. Cool. One very second cool. image uh, with your eye nebula. Through that little um, camera scope, CD, CD camera. I'm not sure exactly what it is altogether, but I know it's a it's a new toy. It's uh, just new on the market, and yeah. uh, it, it does do. It is apparently the newest thing in astrophotography. So he's going to send me some more clips as he gets them, um, and uh, we're looking forward to them. Yeah, good stuff, Pat. He's just getting started. He said so. Uh, we got these ones from Clayton Carr, Clayton uh, Easter Sunday morning, uh, Moon from St. Martin's. Very nice. A nice one. Uh, which was that? Nine was the key. No, it was nine. I forget what the key was. Uh, I'll just keep it here. Anyway, okay, here's another one. And there's the third. Screw the tree. Thanks, Clayton. Nice. Okay, I'm going to go from there to Winston Coke. Winston had this one of... Uh, Nice look at this moon. Yes, sir. And uh, he had these ones of his first. He says, my first sun picks. So there we go. Awesome. There you go. Got them up. Got them. The activity, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice little bunch there. That is, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, okay. Was that from uh, Sunday? Uh, I maybe? think that was from, it might have been from today, I think. Today or yesterday. I, think uh, I didn't look at today's. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got this one from Derek King. Uh, he said, Hey, Chris, uh, Moon Dog, Eye in the Sky, whatever it is, just wow. He said, Took this uh, tonight. This was on April the 4th, uh, around 9 45 p.m. Ring around the moon was huge. That's Excellent. amazing. You don't see that all that often, mm -hmm. those uh, moon dogs, right? Nothing, yeah. Moon dog shot. Well done. <laughs> Hoping uh, many others were able to see it too and grab a few photos better than mine. I, I, that's a pretty good one right there. Mm. Yeah, Winston says that was today's sun. Today's sun. Okay, thananks, Winston. Sun? Yeah, the sun shot. The, oh, the, sun the, dog. Somebody sun had moon dogs. Yeah. Like he's, he's okay. Yeah. No, that is moon dog there, and there's another one. Um, these oh, awesome. From, uh, these are from Matthew Dupre. Matthew says some early submissions for the week. I think these. Um, I think these would be called moon dogs. Yeah, yeah, they are. There's another Quite one there. impressive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. great shot there. You got to be exactly the right angle to get that, and yeah. that's beautiful. Captured it nicely. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, well done. Good stuff, Matthew. Um, Irene Doyle, he was this one. Yeah, this is her pink moon. She said, "My pink moon from the other night uh, took advantage of clear skies." 
We'll only be full today, apparently, but it sure looked full and beautiful. Taking with my cool picks P1000. Very right done. Nice job. job. Detail around the bottom. It's hard to get that detail when it's that full. It is. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go from that one to uh, Kathy Adams, full moon shot. Yes, sir. Sure. Another one. Yeah, beautiful. Shots. Yeah. She does some amazing work. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Brad Perry. Uh, oh, said, nice. uh, here are a couple of moonshots from this week. One of the almost full moon setting in Fredericton on Wednesday morning, April the 5th at 6.31 a.m. That's nice pretty. Capture. Wow. Well, nice for That's yeah. in Fredericton. That's in Fredericton, yeah. Yeah. And then he's just the second one here. Um, this is the uh, waning gibbous moon rising in Summerside last night at 11.24 p.m. Love the lighting, man. That's awesome. That's amazing. He does some awesome work. Yeah. Yeah. He sends some yeah. amazing Aurora stuff for sure as well. So thanks, uh, Brad. Okay. And uh, we're going to go from there to our normal photo, which would be sending your photos into us. Uh, send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. We love getting them. We love sharing them. So please drop them by. Very nice. Get out, take a picture. Send it to us. Please. <laughs> Yeah, pick two. <laughs> pick one. Send it to us. Yeah, I can't believe this is like the second clear night or third clear night in a row. Second. Uh, Isn't that crazy? <laughs> We're not used know. to this. Last night was incredible. Like uh, looking off to the west last night had Venus and Pleiades just above it. It was beautiful. Uh, and yeah. of course, the Pleiades are, are Venus is closer to the Pleiades tonight again, and then through the next few nights. So you want to get out and catch those because they're easy to spot. The brightest object in the western part of the sky. And look just near it for that little cluster of stars. Look like a mini dipper. Look for that. Uh, try it through binoculars. Get a get a photo of it. Send it into the page. We'd love to have it. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, from there, uh, I'm closing in, I guess, tonight. Thanks again for all your support out there. A special thanks as well, uh, as always, to Rosanna. How she comes up with them, I don't know, but we, we really do enjoy them. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, thank you, Rosanna. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, also, a special thanks goes out to Trudy and all of you who continually share our program out there. Um, we also hope that those of you who joined us from Rogers enjoyed the program tonight. If you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can uh, find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. And... As we like to say, guys, uh, we'll be, uh, please let your friends and family know that we'll be here again next Sunday night at 8 p.m. Uh, to entertain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and I, we wish you a safe week, lots of clear skies. As we like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Open it up. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Good night, everyone. <laughs>